Thank you for joining us today at Discovery Park of America. I'm Katie Jarvis from Discovery Park of America here in Union City, Tennessee. I will be your host for this and other lessons with professors from the University of Tennessee at Martin. These lessons are for students in grades six through nine, but they will be of interest to anyone. Today we are with Dr. Dawn Wilkins, a professor of biology at UT Martin. She will be teaching us a lesson on the biology of birds, going over how their feathers work, and we find out if bones are really hollow. So thank you, Dr. Wilkins, for uh, being on the show today. Thanks for having me. I always find it a pleasure to talk about birds. Oh, yes. Yeah, and I'm gonna be showing you several, several images, or, or I guess you'll see them as images, several birds today. And one of the things I want you to know is we did not go out and kill these birds. They were donated to the university. Some of them were hit by cars or flew into windows and things like that. So I don't want you to get the wrong idea about them. The one that I'm holding up right now is our state bird, Northern Mockingbird. And whenever I ask people what they think about when they think about birds, it is that they fly. But birds are not the only animals that fly. So do other animals like bats and insects. And so what really makes birds unique is that they have feathers, okay? No other animal on the planet has feathers except for the birds. And feathers are really cool. They have a central shaft down through the middle, and then they have these pieces that branch off of them. And sometimes the feathers will be fluffy like this so that they can use those for insulation. But the ones that they use for flying will be very compact like you see here. And it's hard to tell that these are actually individual little things branching off the center. Okay, and now it looks like they're in pretty bad shape, right? Right. That the bird's not gonna be able to fly anymore. But what the bird can do is just run it through its bill. And because they have kind of a Velcro-like structure, it just seals it all back up. And then you have a nice flight surface again. I've and noticed, bird, I've noticed birds doing that. Like the ducks out here at Discovery Park, I've noticed them doing that. So that's why. That's why. Yeah, they're restoring the integrity of their feather. That's a fancy way to say it. And so that allows them to have this nice flight surface that can catch the wind. Now, many of the feathers of the birds, like the one I held up a second ago that's all fluffy, are attached to the skin, just like your hair grows out of a follicle. But some of the feathers that are their main flight feathers are actually anchored in the bone. Wow. And that gives them a lot more support and structure. And so here I've got a wing of a barred owl that we have uh, removed the feathers from so that you can see that structure. And even when I'm just holding it, you can see it just catches the wind very easily. Mm -hmm. And that is sort of their flight surfaces and the ways that they, they do that. And so feathers are used for many different things. Some of them are colorful. Like, I don't know if we can see the color very well. Here's a feather from a blue jay. Yeah, I see the blue. And so you have some that are colorful that are used for attracting mates. You have feathers that are used for different types of specialized flight and all kinds of stuff. And they're pretty cool. Now, some birds, like the Northern Cardinal right here, are getting the color that you see from the food that they eat. And so cardinals eat red berries, and then the red pigments from the berries end up in their feathers. Oh, wow. So I have a question. Yes. Already off the bat. Okay. So I've always, if I'm remembering right, from your biology class, <laughs> um, now are the females, they're not as colorful as the males. That's correct. I didn't pull a female out. I should have. Okay. Yeah, so this is a male cardinal. Right okay. Red. So do they eat and more the, berries? Is that why they're redder than a female cardinal? Um, the, it's not because they eat more berries. It has uh, genetic controls in okay. there as well. And so if you look at the female cardinal, she has some feathers that are just as red as the male, mm -hmm. but she's more of a orangey brown color. Right. And that's more having to do with her sex than her diet. Okay. That I was just curious. Yeah. Um, well, what I wanted to tell you about the blue jay feather is that the blue color you see in the blue jay is a lie. They're lying to you. Oh, They're yeah. actually gray. And so what you're actually seeing when you get that blue color is an optical illusion. And so when light hits the feather, it's reflecting blue light. There's actually no blue pigment in the feather. Wow. Is, so, that, a, yeah. is that like a defense mechanism or why? No, it's, a, it's the same type of purpose as having uh, red feathers. It's just that's the way that you get the blues and some of the greens in birds. They're actually uh, reflected light rather oh, than their wow. diet. Probably most popular or most familiar would be the flamingos. And the yeah. people that they have. 
and that pink color is from the crustaceans that they eat. Yes, I love flamingos. They're my favorite bird. <laughs> they're, they're really weird birds. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I often talk about when I discuss birds are their bills. And their bills are very important to them. They're made out of a substance that's very similar to your fingernails. Uh, it's a type of what's called a keratin. And that makes them extremely lightweight. And that's important because you want to be able to fly. You don't want to carry a lot of extra weight. And so if you think about something like a toucan, mm -hmm. <laughs> if the toucan had a big heavy bill, it wouldn't be able to fly. It would just keep hitting the ground with its bill. But it's able to carry that because it's very, very light and hollow. And birds don't have any teeth. So there's no teeth. But we can learn a lot about the birds by looking at their bills. And so if you look at these two birds, their bills are very different. Right. The cardinal has a extremely thick bill because they crush seeds. And that's what they do. And if you look at the mockingbird, it has a very, very thin bill because they are going to be picking berries and catching insects. Oh. And so the bill tells you quite a bit about what they do. And so if you pick up a woodpecker, oops, I'm upside down. This is a pileated woodpecker. Theirs is almost like a chisel for mm -hmm. digging into wood. And then we can look at things like a duck. So I've got a big old mallard here. And you mm -hmm. look at the mallard's bill. If you look real carefully, yeah, you can see it's got some little bumps there underneath yeah. the bill. And that's because they use it to help strain the water to get the food that they eat. Okay. And then you get things like raptors. So here's a great horned owl. Oh, wow. The horns are kind of are kind of uh, down on him. But they have the nice hooked bill, mm -hmm. and that hooked bill is used to let's see, that's better, that's better probably, uh, to rip flesh because that's what they do, right? They're birds of prey. Right. So the bills can tell you a lot about that. Um, because they don't have any teeth, they can't chew their food, right? Right. And so <laughs> a lot of birds, what they'll do is they'll swallow their food whole. And, you know, that makes sense for some of them that might be eating insects or something like that. But something like an owl again, or also brought a red-tailed hawk, probably mostly interested in the tail. Oh, wow. So another raptor you could sell by its hooked bill. Mm -hmm. um, they swallow their prey whole, and it's things like mice yeah. or lizards or birds and things like that. And when it gets into the digestive tract, all the parts they can digest are going to be turned into a slush. And then the parts they can't digest, like bones and fur, end up getting compacted into a pellet. I've heard of pellets. I think some of our viewers might have dissected some. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so it's a very popular thing. And if you break open a pellet, and I haven't broken open this one before, uh, what you'll find is you have the fur on the outside, and then you're going to have bones on the inside. And so here, yeah, I know it's so small. Just pulled out a, I'll put it up there, a jaw. Oh, my. A mouse. And then I'm seeing a skull. So let's see if we can <gasps> get that out. Wow. And then, I guess I could do it where you can see what I'm doing. Well, I don't want to do yeah. it on top of the owl. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. So it takes a little bit to get them cleaned up and get all the fur pulled out. But you can start to see you got the teeth right, right in the front. And then oh, there's wow. the eye socket on the side. And so I'm starting to get it uncovered, and you can tell that that's the skull of the mouse that it wow. ate. Wow! And what kind of where what kind of pellet was that? For, or bird was that pellet from? Was that an that owl? Pellet, yeah, that pellet was from a barn owl. Okay. Which are the whitish owls that we have around here mm -hmm. that are pretty common. I didn't get one out today to show you. Um, I got out the let's see, is that what I was saying? I got out the owl, the great horned owl, uh, because when I stuffed him, so we removed the insides and replaced it with cotton. I mounted him so that his feet were wide open. Look at those yeah. claws. So you could see his talons. Wow, talons. So that's the fancy word. Yeah, yeah, that's a fancy word. <laughs> and that's what they use to grab their prey. They're razor sharp and they're very dangerous. And so you don't want to go near a wild owl at any point because it'd be very dangerous to do that. Wow. I've heard of um, like the different, like for an eagle, for example. <laughs> Oh no, technical difficulties. We're fine, we're fine. I've heard that like the pressure of their talons is like so extreme. Can you tell us a little bit about like for the barred owl? I don't know what the pressure is for these owls, like off the top of my head, but you're right. They have incredible power. Um, they have, that's gonna be, it's kind of hard. Well, you can see it a little bit better, but the raptors, 
they tend to have very long legs. You uh -huh. kind of see it here, and they're extremely muscular. Uh -huh. But you don't see on something like a little songbird. It has right. little, you know, little little skinny legs. Right. And that's part of how they're getting that power that you're talking about to grab large prey. You know, like something like a like this red-tailed hawk would be able to capture a, a, a rabbit, for example. And then the great horned owl. This is one of our uh, major predators in terms of birds around here. Their favorite food are striped skunks. Mm -hmm. They can take something like a, a feral cat, uh, possums, things like oh, that. Wow. They'll take fairly large prey. Wow. And I've been pretty to, impressive. Yeah, I've been to um, Real Foot Lake State Park at their visitor center, and I know they have a lot of these owls and birds of prey on display because um, mm -hmm. they're their rehab, they've either hit by, been hit by right. a car or a broken wing or something. And those birds are incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. they just look, they stand so tall, you know, because I do think of the little songbirds and right. they just stand so tall and they look so fluffy. But Absolutely. are they, but they're not, that's not their skeleton. That's all feathers, right? That's all feathers. And that's actually a good point because if you look at something like this uh, woodpecker, which is, this is a pileated, the largest of our woodpeckers, they don't look as fluffy, right? They're right. pretty sleek. When you think about a cardinal, they're pretty sleek. But when you look at the owls, they are oof, extremely <laughs> fluffy. Yeah. They're extremely fluffy. And part of the reason for that is they can fly silently. And that the extra feather and all that fluff helps to absorb some of the sound uh -huh. as they're flying, as well as, I don't know if you'll quite be able to see this on the screen. Um, but the edge of their feathers are serrated rather than smooth. I don't think I don't think I've got one that I can get close enough for you to see that. Okay. But that helps to cut the wind turbulence and, and keep them in soundless flight. So the okay. mouse never hears them before they get hit. Oh my gosh, that's scary. They're literally birds of prey. They're like the silent killer almost. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they're all awesome. um, for their so for the owl, because I just keep thinking about how you know how big it actually looks, but how, if you could compare its skeleton, how little would it be or underneath all the compared flight. to the feathers yeah um for the great horned owl their their bodies are actually fairly big but okay. if you look at it if i press through there the, the body would be like from from here to here okay and it's got about the same width okay of, which is what's nice about the steady skins um and so they're pretty meaty but like little songbirds including a little hummingbird you know that's oh. not going to have very much uh, flesh associated with the mouse. Oh, and maybe he would, you can, see, you can barely see flesh I see, red. I see a little red, a little red. reddish orange, yeah. Yeah, and so this is a ruby-throated hummingbird, and they can flash that red when they get angry, and then they can kind of hide it as well. So if you watch them at the bird feeders, sometimes their throats will seem black, and sometimes they'll flash bright red. And is that a male? This is a male, a male. right? The females have a white throat. Okay. And so, so they're so small that we don't even bother to stuff them we yeah. just kind of dry them out yeah there's not much to them. and his beak is very pointy oh that's a good point yeah okay. his is uh, to go down into the feather uh, the flowers mm -hmm. and he's got a, a tongue that can you pull it curls up? up can you hold him up a little bit a little bit more okay, okay there, there we go. go and he's got a tongue that can curl up almost like a straw to help him sip the nectars out of the out of the um out of the flower oh wow. or out of your bird feeder right and these guys are migrating right now. Oh. Um, they are amazing. This little bird right here, well, not this particular one because, you know, he's gone. Um, but the ones that are still alive are going to move down to the Gulf Coast, and then they're going to fly nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico to South America, where they'll spend the winter. Wow. And then they'll do the same thing in the spring. They'll fly nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico back to the U.S. Just the wow. little, little bitty birds. Wow. I love hummingbirds. They're amazing. So speaking of all the different birds, and um, we talked about the skeleton earlier, um, I've always heard, you know, they've got hollow bones, or maybe they do, maybe they don't. So do birds really have hollow bones? All right. I wish you guys could hold this bone. That would be a lot more impressive. And the answer is mixed. Some of their bones are more or less hollow, and some of them aren't. And so if you think about a mammal's bone, like your own bones, inside of there you have something called bone marrow. Mm -hmm. And bone marrow is important because it produces your red blood cells and your white blood cells and things like that. And birds have blood. And so they need bone marrow, just like a mammal would. And so the bone marrow is located in the bones in the center part of their body. 
So like their sternum and ribs and things like that. And then their long bones, this is a leg bone, um, are, don't have bone marrow in them. And so that's what it's referring to as being hollow. Okay. Um, the other thing is they have a much thinner wall than mammal bones, which makes them extremely light. Mm -hmm. And if you actually opened it up, eh, maybe, nah, it's gonna be too exposed, I think. But if you look, if you look, if you were able to really look inside that little hole right there, uh, what you would see is struts. Mm -hmm. And so since the walls are so thin, they need extra support. And so they have these bony struts in there that reinforce them and make them strong. Mm -hmm. But if you had a mammal bone of the same size, it's an incredible difference in, in weight. And what kind of bone is that? What animal is that from? Uh, it's a pelican. I picked it up on the beach. Oh, <laughs> So this wow. is a pelican leg bone. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Real Foot Lake, I've learned a little bit about the, the Mississippi Flyway. Mm -hmm. And so right. um, I know that Real Foot Lake, which is only 23 miles from us at Discovery Park, has just I don't know if it's a gazillion or I know several species of different birds that come. Of course, the bald eagles are down there um, and I think all the time, but really January, February during the cold winter months. Mm -hmm. And then I've also heard that there's going to be pelicans coming to mm -hmm. Real Foot Lake. So can you tell us a little bit about, because when I think pelicans, I think beach. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us right. why they're there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, or at least I can try to. Yeah. Uh, so Real Foot Lake is an, a an very important place because it is along the Mississippi Flyway, like you said. So it's a place where, peop where, where birds that are migrating from Canada down to the coast for the winter are able to stop over and get the food that they need. And that's part of the job of the National Wildlife Refuge that's there, as well as the wildlife management areas. Mm -hmm. And they cater a lot to our waterfowl mm -hmm. and other water-loving species like the pelicans. Mm -hmm. um, the white pelicans were impacted by um, DDT, which is a pesticide that impacted a lot of our fish eating birds, including the bald eagles and ospreys and cormorants and things like that. And so their numbers went down considerably. And so I think people kind of forgot that they hang out in fresh water. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they do is they fly up to Canada and they breed around the, what are called the pits, which are these impressions that you need Dr. Gibson for geology again, but they're <laughs> depressions from glacial activity and stuff like that that are filled with fresh water, and that's where they actually breed. And then they come through a flyway during migration. But we do have some that have started to stay year round. And so it's not unusual to see one at real foot in the summer, but there aren't as many as there are in the winter, kind of like the eagles. There's okay. Not very cool, because I know that Pelican Fest is coming up in October, I think, at Real Foot Lake. So um, I'm I'm curious to see them. Is it white pelicans or are they gray just or the white? Blue? Yeah, okay. it's just the white pelicans. The brown pelicans that you see when you go down to the coast, those are saltwater pelicans. They okay. Don't come in one. Yeah. Okay. What other um, birds can you find on the Mississippi Flyway, like the or at Real Foot Lake? You mentioned one, I know one that people get confused with the bald eagle. They think it's a bald eagle, but it's not. What was that one again? Uh, that's probably osprey. Yes. They have a white, yeah, they have white head. And if you see them fly over and they have a white chest, uh -huh. and that's an osprey. Okay. The eagles are black. You know, okay. When you get past the head. And they're a little bit smaller. I, when I'm out at Real Foot um, and I see people just kind of looking around, a lot of times they'll mistake osprey nests for bald eagle nests. Yes. Um, because the ospreys are adapted for fishing um, very strongly. So they can fold their body up and put their talons out and they can grab a fish up to two meters down in the water and fly off with it, which is incredible. Wow. But because they're so adapted to that type of thing, they can't maneuver around branches, for example. Uh -huh. So if you see a big stick nest in the top of a cypress out in the open at Real Foot, that's an osprey nest. Okay. If you see a big stick nest that has trees around it, um, like up on the levee, and there's one, a couple of them right around Tiptonville, um, those are bald eagles. So they're a little bit more maneuverable because bald eagles aren't specialized for fish eating. They're, they're actually scavengers for the most uh, part. <laughs> oh, very cool. Well, thank you. Um, so we've talked about the different bones. We've talked about feathers. We've talked about their bills. So okay. what about their voices? Why okay. do birds sing? That's a great question. It's a question I get all the time. Um, birds sing for lots of different reasons, but the two main reasons are to attract a mate and defend their territory where they live. And so in the spring, that's when you hear the birds being the most vocal for the mm -hmm. most part. 
And when you're listening to them, it's usually the male. So this is a male cardinal, right? The bright red male. And the female, though, does have some calls that they give. And I think that's something, especially my ornithology students, don't really think about at first because there's all kinds of calls that they give. They give um, contact calls or little chips that help them communicate between the male and the female to let them know where each other are. Um, in the winter, you get little flocks of birds and they'll make little sounds, uh, sometimes for the same purpose to keep the flock together. But sometimes when you hear like chickadees in the winter, um, they're telling the rest of the flock that they see a predator, for example, so they can communicate information about that. Um, and so they give more than just one type of call. So uh, like a cardinal says, uh, birdie, 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 birdie. If you know that call, that's its breeding call. Mm -hmm. But they give a variety of other sounds that have different purposes, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. And then if you go back to the woodpeckers, this is our smallest woodpecker, a downy woodpecker. Um, they use their bills and they drum on the side of trees. That is, they hit it really hard in a rhythm like, like that on the side mm -hmm. of trees. Mm -hmm. And that's serving a similar purpose. They use that for breeding and for territorial defense um, as well. And so it doesn't have to be vocal. It mm -hmm. can also be what we call non-vocal. And then there are some birds that will beat their wings against their chest. Mm -hmm. And then others like um, night hawks that fly around the buildings in the cities that use sounds of wing whistles. And so when they fly, the wind whistles to the feathers and makes a sound that way. Wow. So there's lots of different ways they communicate. That's amazing. And can we find all these birds that you have shown us? Um, can you find those in Tennessee? All of the birds I brought out today are Tennessee birds. Um, there are a lot of different Tennessee birds. I don't know what the official count is. It's over 200. Um, but yeah, there's lots of different kinds and they vary from ducks to, to, um, to the woodpeckers, to what are called songbirds, like our state bird, the northern mockingbird, owls. Uh, hawks, a variety of stuff, and then stuff you probably never heard about, like gallinules and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Or in real foot, you can see dick sizzles quite a lot. A lot of people oh. think that's a funny name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it, what kind of bird is that? Is it big or another little songbird? It's a songbird, and it's small. It's got a yellow with, uh, on its chest with a black V, mm -hmm. and it's real common in the wet marshes around real foot. I think actually, because I took a pontoon boat um, ride out there, the ones that Real Foot Lake offer, and one of them followed the boat. And I thought, that is the prettiest little yellow bird I've ever seen. So I bet that was or that might have, or it could have been a plethonotary warbler, which is okay. also a really weird name. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're sometimes called golden swamp warblers, uh -huh. and they're bright yellow, and they're really friendly, and they yeah. nest in cavities around the lake. Yeah, because I think it had its little nest in the pontoon boat. Yeah, it could have, yeah. Okay. Very cool. Well, thank you, Dr. Wilkins, for taking time to talk to us about the birds today and the biology of birds. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, nah, I think we've about covered what we can. But okay. if you have any other questions about birds, just let me know. Great, we will do. And thank you for joining us today, our viewers. We look forward to continuing our mission of inspiring children and adults to see beyond. For more educational resources, visit our website at discoveryparkofamerica.com education. Thanks so much. Thanks.